The Magic Bell Once upon a time, in a small village, lived a poor boy named Pooh. He lived with his mother and younger brother. Pooh lived in a small hut which stood right in the center of the village. To earn a livelihood for his family, he used to graze cattle with some of his friends near the mountains, and in the evening, returned them to their respective owners. Every day, while the cattle went for grazing, he loved to sit under a tree and play melodious tunes on his wooden flute. Hey Pooh, why do you always play your flute at this very spot? I don't know. I love this tree, and you may think I'm crazy, but I feel like this tree is alive and listens to my music. Oh, you're right. What? You think so, too? No! I meant you're right that I think you're crazy. <laughs> but Pooh was right. The tree did listen to his music. The music had touched the tree's spirit. It would listen to the tune intently and be happy to have Pooh play it every day. One day, as Pooh was slumbering on one of the branches of the tree, there was a terrible noise beneath him. Ah, oh, what's, what's that? Oh, earthquake, earthquake! There was a woodcutter cutting the same tree where Pooh was sleeping. Who is this man? Phew, this will take some time. Pooh soon understood what was going on and quickly climbs downward. Hey, what are you doing? Why are you cutting this tree? My master would like to use it for his boat. This tree is very strong. No, you can't cut it. Really? And why is that? Listen, I've spent many days trying to find strong support for the boat. And you don't own this tree, so don't waste my time. Pooh will soon have to do something to save the tree, or it will be too late. So he used his cleverness to try and scare the woodcutter away. He said, Well, you can't say I didn't warn you. It's bound to happen, I suppose. What's that supposed to mean? Don't you know? A spirit of an old witch lives in this tree. She's been staying here for years. If you cut this tree down, she'll latch herself onto you, of course. Latch? Latch onto me? Why? Isn't it obvious? Since you're the one cutting down this tree? Are you trying to fool me? I'm smarter than you think, boy. I'm not going to fall for this story. Go away now. Who was desperate to save this tree. As soon as the woodcutter got busy, Pooh climbed up and went straight to the top. He hid in the dense leaves and began to scream. Ah! Ha ha ha! How dare you touch my home! What? Who is that? If you destroy my home, I will come to live with you, and I will never leave you, human. The boy was right. Don't worry, human. We will be good friends. <laughs> the woodcutter began to run as fast as he could. What's the hurry, my friend? Just as Pooh was laughing at the woodcutter, the tree came to life. Pooh. Pooh was shocked to hear someone talking to him. Are, are you really the spirit of an old witch? <laughs> no, Pooh. I am not an old witch spirit. I mean, I am old, but I am the spirit of this tree. Your music brought me to life. You are a cunning boy, Pooh, and I am grateful to you. You saved me from the woodcut. Suddenly, a nice golden bell appeared in front of Pooh, which was floating in mid-air. Here, accept this as a thank you gift. A bell? Not just an ordinary bell, my dear. This is a magical bell. Every time you ring it, the plate will magically fill with delicious food to eat. Oh, wow! This will really help me and my family! 
Yes, it, it will. But remember, Pooh, you can only ring this bell once in a day. I will remember that. Thank you, dear tree. Pooh ran to call his mother and brother in the village. Mom! Ronnie! Come here and look what I've got! He shared the incident with them. They were very happy to see the magic bell. They wished for their favorite foods, rang the bell, and ate to their heart's content. Afterwards, they went to bed with their tummies full after a long and delicious meal. The next morning, as usual, Pooh took the cattle out to graze on the pasture, leaving the bell at home. When he came back in the evening, tired and hungry, he found all the pots empty. There was no food left for him to eat. Pooh was saddened and just ate the leftovers that he found in a cupboard. Still being hungry after his meager meal, he went to bed. He couldn't sleep due to his tummy growling of hunger. So he decided to take the magic bell with him the next day. When his mother and younger brother were hungry later that day, they looked for the bell. They searched the entire hut from top to bottom, but couldn't find the magic bell, which made them very sad. They thought that they had lost the bell. They had neither the bell nor food. They went to bed on empty stomachs. When Pooh returned home in the evening, he took out the magic bell from his satchel. He ordered his most favorite food. His mother and younger brother were very sad to see this. His younger brother started crying, and he said, Brother, we're so hungry, and we kept looking for the bell. You have become so selfish. How could you? Hearing this, Pooh realized his mistake. He regretted his decision, but he also shared with his honest thoughts. You asked the bell to give you food, but you forgot to save some for me. I was tired and went to bed hungry and it hurt my feelings, so I was sad and angry. His brother and mother also realized their mistakes. They ate their meal together as a family that night. And from that day onwards, they never slept with empty stomachs and lived happily ever after. The End The Magic Grinder Long, long ago, in Egypt, there was a poor maiden named Naur. She worked for a greedy lord by the name of Anubis. While he sat in the shade all day, Naur and her nephews worked in the garden. Naur picked fruits and vegetables, while Ra and Seth pulled and cut the weeds. At the end of each day, they brought their basket of food to Lord Anubis, and he would put the heavy basket on the scale. Hmm, not bad. But whenever Naur asked for her pay, he always shouted, Come back tomorrow. So Naur had no money. Without money, she could not buy food for her nephews. One day, she went to the cupboard, and it was empty. I will go and ask Lord Anubis for some food. Naur went straight to the Lord's house. He came to the door himself, rather than one of his servants. What do you want? I'm a very busy man. Naur peeked into his dining room. When she saw the delicious food, she was hungrier than ever. I only want a little food. My nephews are very hungry. Food? I don't have enough for myself. He lied. Go away. Poor Naur. Away she went, without food for herself or her nephews. On her way home, Naur had to pass a cave. Suddenly, she heard a strange moaning and groaning. It was coming from inside. I wonder what that could be. It sounds like someone is hurt. It was a serpopard, stuck under some stones and hollering loudly in pain. 
Nauer was afraid at first. But after listening to his cries for help for a while, she felt pity and was no longer afraid. So she called to the Serpapard. What can I do to help you? These rocks are too heavy for me to pick up. The Serpapard pointed to a shelf in the corner. It was filled with beautiful treasures. Take down the golden grinder and bring it here to me. Nower handed the grinder to him. Watch and listen. He began to turn the handle. As he turned, he said, Golden Grinder, help me, please. You will know just what I need. As soon as he said those magic words, a shovel was standing beside him. All by itself, it began to dig. It lifted the heavy rock. Suddenly, another shovel appeared. It started digging, too. Then came another shovel, and another, and another. After some time, all the shovels completed their work. The Serpapard said, Golden Grinder, stop and stay. The Grinder stopped making shovels. At last, the Serpapard was free once again. Because you have helped me. I'm going to give you this magic grinder. Just say the magic words, and it will give you anything you want. Oh, thank you. The Serpapard waved goodbye to Nower. Now don't forget the magic words to make the grinder stop. <laughs> it won't stop unless you say those exact words. I won't forget them. Away she ran to show her nephews the wonderful magic grinder. When her nephews saw the grinder, they were not very happy. Where is our food, Aunt Nower? We will have food. Listen. Nower began to turn the handle. Golden Grinder, help me, please. You will know just what I need. Suddenly, the table was covered with food. There were turkey and ham, mashed potatoes, peas and carrots, fruit and cheese and milk and bread. Then, Nower said, Golden Grinder, stop and stay. The Grinder stopped making food. Then, Ra cried, Oh, Auntie, let's ask for new clothes. Nower said the magic words. Presto! There were dressed in fine new clothes. Then Seth said, Let's ask for new furniture. When Nower turned the handle and said the magic words, the grinder gave them fine new furniture. Then Ra and Seth cried together, we are rich! They bounced up and down on their new bed. Just remember, never tell anyone the magic words. Next morning, Nower and her nephews did not go to work in Lord Anubis' garden. Nower stayed home to plant some flowers. Seth and Ra went fishing at the stream. Lord Anubis soon came to visit and find out why Nower and her nephews had not come to work for him that day. He was surprised to see their new things. He cried in surprise. All of this can't be yours. Where did you get everything? It's a secret I can't tell you. If you don't tell me, I will go to the king. He will throw you into the jail for stealing. Nower showed the grinder to him. I did not steal anything. This grinder gives me whatever I want. Lord Anubis snatched it away from her. I'll take care of that for you. And he ran straight home. He put it down 
and turned the handle and said, I want some gold, please. Nothing happened. Then he shouted angrily, I want gold now. Still, nothing happened. Then he said, I will find out how to make it obey me. Off he ran to find Nower's nephews. As for Nower and her nephews, they never went to work for Lord Anubis again. Nower sowed in her own shady garden. Seth and Ra spent their time fishing, and the magic grinder gave them everything they needed to live happily ever after. Lord Anubis found Seth and Ra fishing at the stream. My dear fellows, I hear you have a grinder that gives you anything you want. Tell me, how does this magic grinder work? It's easy. You just you just say, Golden Grinder, help me please. You know just what I need. And out comes whatever you want. Seth quickly poked his brother. He whispered, That's a secret. Ra did not say another word. Very interesting. Now he knew how to make the grinder work. He ran towards his ship to flee from the village so that no one can take his magical grinder. He could hardly wait to try it again. So he began to turn the handle into the sea. I should test it first. For now, I'll ask for a little salt. In his greediest voice, he said, Golden Grinder, help me, please. You know just what I need. Sure enough, the grinder began to make salt. Then it made more salt. Now his boat was filled with salt, and it became so heavy, so he cried, Stop it! Stop it! Oh, Grinder! Hey, stop now! But he did not know the magical words, so the grinder did not stop. Soon, his ship started sinking because of the weight, and finally the ship and Anubis drowned in the water. But children, do you know? That magical grinder is still running and making salt, and that is why seawater is so salty. The End The Magic Little Pencil Noah got off his school bus and stepped out on the street in the little town in which he lived. He never imagined that this would be the weirdest day of his life. He was walking on a crosswalk when he saw an old man shivering from the cold and looking very hungry and begging politely for food. P -p please Help me. I haven't eaten in two days. Can you spare a little something to eat? Noah felt pity for the old man. So he went to a nearby shop and bought food, as well as a bottle of water for him. He gave the shopkeeper the money which he had been saving up to buy a new pencil box for himself. It wasn't long before he was walking up to the old man. Here. This is for you. Oh, thank you, dear boy. I thought I was going to starve to death. That is so kind of you. After eating the food and drinking some of the water that Noah had kindly brought him, he began to feel better and turned a proud gaze upon Noah. I've been searching for a kind-hearted person for a very long time. I do believe that my search ends today. Noah was confused when he heard this, so he asked the old man politely. What do you mean? The old man reached into the satchel he was carrying and pulled out an antique box. He looked solemn and reverent as he slowly opened it to reveal its contents. Inside rested a very old pencil, which was shining as a bright little star. Noah was astonished by this sight. Suddenly, the old man abruptly closed the rusty lid, handing it to Noah, and says to him, Noah, 
Yes, I know your name, for I am a wizard. I have been on a very long quest, seeking out a boy such as yourself, who would be willing to put aside their own desires in order to help others. Now, you can help others with this magic pencil. Just draw whatever you wish, and it will appear in before you instantly. Oh, wow! Thank you, kind wizard. Now I can help people in need whenever I want. This is great! Thank you so much! Just remember these two things. Don't tell this secret to anyone, or else they may steal it from you. And secondly, if you need my help at any time, you can just draw a picture of me, and I will be there in an instant. Don't worry, wizard. I will remember your instructions. Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, the wizard disappeared, and Noah excitedly continued his journey home. Noah couldn't wait to try out his magic pencil. So he draws a cake, and presto! It was instantly in front of him, sitting on a silver platter. The next day, he started to help each and every person he could find that needed something or other. He was walking down the road when he saw an overworked bellhop from a local hotel trying unsuccessfully to carry an overabundance of heavy and awkwardly shaped luggage. So, to help the young man out, Noah draws a baggage cart for him in order to ease his heavy burden. Then he saw a little girl who was barefoot and trying to sell matches, and no one seemed to care. But Noah did, and he proceeded to draw a basket of food along with some cozy slippers for her. After a while, he saw some homeless people shivering on the cold, hard street. So, he drew some small but beautiful houses for them to call homes of their very own. That's how Noah chose to help the people around him. One day, when he was helping a poor man, the greedy and selfish mayor saw the kind and helpful boy. The mayor also saw how the little boy Noah was able to make all these things appear out of thin air with a simple yet magical pencil. The next day, the mayor ordered some policemen to arrest the boy for the illegal use of magic towards the unfortunate, because the law that the mayor had made only allowed the use of magic for the wealthy people of the land. The police found Noah using his magic pencil for all to see, magically helping those less fortunate than himself, and arrested him on the spot and dragged him off to present him to the mayor. He said, Noah, I saw how you helped those sick, hungry, hopeless, homeless, and poor people. Now you must help me. Draw me what I want. A tree that produces fruit of solid gold. Sir, with all due respect, I only help poor and needy people, and you're neither poor nor needy. It's not a request, Noah. I am ordering you to do so. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, but I will not do this. Then be prepared for a severe punishment, you stupid boy. The mayor then demanded his servants to snatch the magic pencil from Noah. One policeman successfully did so and gave it to the mayor. Now, the mayor began to draw a tree with golden fruit. It was a nice picture, full of colorful detail, but the magic within the pencil didn't respond to him. He then handed the writing utensil over to the policeman, who also tried but failed as well to conjure up anything from his stick drawing of a horse which he had scribbled on a fresh sheet of paper. The policeman commented to the mayor, I think the pencil won't take any orders from us, sir. It only recognizes Noah's hand, so only the boy can fulfill your wish, mayor. 
The greedy mayor was furious. Noah, I'm asking you for the last time. Are you going to draw me, golden fruit tree, or not? Choose your words wisely. They may be your last. Noah was a brave boy, but at this point, he only wanted to end this whole fiasco. So he said he would draw something, and the mayor handed the boy the magic pencil. The next thing Noah draws is the picture of an old man on the piece of paper, and the wizard who had given the clever and kind boy the magic pencil came to rescue Noah. As soon as he appeared, the old man turned those policemen into cats, and he said, "Don't you dare try to misuse the magic of this pencil for your own greedy endeavors, Mr. Mayor. Otherwise, you will be the next one who will lick his own tail." The mayor was greatly frightened and shivered with fear. Then the old man admonished the mayor not to be so greedy and selfish. The mayor also acknowledged his wrongs and apologized to Noah and the wizard. The very next day, the mayor rewarded Noah for his kind deeds and acts of helpfulness for the whole townspeople to see, and Noah continued to help those less fortunate and lived happily ever after. The end. The Magic Ring. A wealthy father gave his son three hundred gold coins and sent him off to journey the world in search of finding a trade for his unique skills. Robin, for that was the son's name, took the money and said farewell to his father. He had not gotten very far when he came across some herdsmen quarreling over a dog that some of them wished to kill. Please do not kill the dog. I will give you one hundred gold coins for it," pleaded the young fellow. Then and there, the bargain was struck, and the foolish young man took the dog and continued on his way. It was not long after that he met up with some folks fighting about a cat. Some of them wanted to kill it, but others did not. Oh, please do not kill it! I will give you one hundred gold coins for it. Of course, they at once gave him the cat and took the money. He went on till he reached a village where some folk were quarreling over a snake that had just been caught. Some of them wished to kill it, but others did not. Please do not kill the snake. I will give you one hundred gold coins for it. Of course, the people agreed, and were highly delighted. Upon becoming the proud new owner of a snake, a dog, and cat, Robin went home. You fool! You scamp! Exclaimed his father when he had heard how his son had wasted all the money that had been given to him. Go and live in the stables and repent of your folly. You shall never again enter my house. So the young man went and lived in the stables. His companions were the dog, the cat, and the snake. These creatures grew very fond of him. One day, the snake, in course of conversation, said to its master. I am the son of King Basilisk. One day, when I had come out of the ground to drink the air, some people seized me and would have killed me had you not most opportunely arrived at my rescue. How glad my father would be to see his son be rescued! Where does he live? I should like to see him, if possible. Well said. Do you see Mount Olympus? At the bottom of that mountain, there is a sacred spring well. If you come with me and dive into that spring, we shall both reach my father's country. Oh, he will wish to reward you too. However, if he asks what you would like, you would reply, "The ring on your right hand and the famous pot and spoon which you possess. With these in your possession, you would never need anything, for the ring is magical." You would have to speak to it, and immediately a beautifully furnished mansion will be provided for you. And the pot and the spoon will supply you with all manner of the rarest and most delicious foods. Attended by his three critter companions, the man walked to the well and prepared to jump in, according to the snake's directions. 
he ordered his dog and cat to stay behind and protect the entrance. The young man and the snake reached their destination in safety, and information of their arrival was sent to the King Basilisk. Then the king went and embraced his son, and saluting the stranger, welcomed him to his dominions. Welcome to the land of serpents, young man. You saved my son's life, and I am so much thankful for that. Now your wish is my command. Please ask anything, and I will provide that to you in an instant. Thank you, King Basilisk, but I do not want anything in exchange. It is a wise man's duty to save the poor soul if he saw one in trouble. You are not only kind, but gentlemanly also. It is my request. You should stay here for several days. The young man stayed there for a few days, during which he received the king's right-hand ring and the pot and spoon in recognition of his highness's gratitude to him for having delivered his son. He then returned. On reaching the top of the spring, he found his friends, the dog and the cat, waiting for him. Afterward, they walked together to the riverside, where it was decided to try the powers of the charmed ring and pot and spoon. The merchant's son spoke to the ring, and immediately a beautiful house and a lovely princess with golden hair appeared. He soon got married to the princess. They all together established their own kingdom, where people were never hungry because of the magical pot and spoon. Time and again he used his magical ring and helped others in his kingdom, and they lived very happily ever after. With only 300 gold coins, which he spends to save his friend's life, he gets tons of happiness and wealth in return. So kids, the moral of this story is good deeds always pay handsomely. The End The Magic Porridge Pot Once upon a time, there was a sweet little girl named Melody. She lived with her mother in a small cottage. They were very, very poor, but Melody tried to make her mother happy by singing songs to her. Every day, Melody used to go into the woods to find something to eat. She used to bring back whatever she could find, but their bellies were never full. One day, saddened with their poverty, Melody left the house and went into the woods looking for something to eat. No matter how hard she searched, there was nothing to be found. Finally, Melody could bear it no more. She sat on a rock and started to cry. While crying, she sang a sad song in her sweet, melodious voice. Hearing her voice, a forest fairy appeared in front of her and said, What happened, my child? Why are you crying? And what are you doing alone in the woods? I am here to find something to eat for me and my mother. We are very poor and very hungry, said Melody with grief on her face. Don't worry, the fairy said, and with her magical wand, she changed a pebble into a big magical pot. Melody was amazed to see the magic. Take this pot home, and your family shall never be hungry again. I don't want to be rude, but what good is an empty pot if there's no food in it to cook? Melody said in a disheartening voice, to which the fairy answered, This is a magical pot. When you want something to eat, say, Cook, pot, cook. And when it's ready, say, stop, pot, stop. <sighs> Melody was delighted with the gift she got from the fairy. And, with due respect, she asked the fairy, Oh, dear fairy godmother, 
I don't have enough words to thank you. Please, tell me what I can do for you in return. I don't want anything in return. But if you want, you can sing me a beautiful song every day. Before Melody could ask any more questions, the forest fairy disappeared. When Melody arrived home with nothing but an empty pot, her mother was very unhappy and said, What use is the pot if you have nothing to cook in it? Melody lifted the pot to the table and simply said, Cook, pot, cook! Nothing happened. Melody looked worried, but then the pot started to shake and hissed. The steam rose and up bubbled the creamiest porridge they had ever seen. Melody's mother understood that the pot was magical. She was so hungry <laughs> that she could mm. not resist the creamy mm. porridge, oh, it's and delicious. she licked it with her finger. She was overwhelmed with the taste of the porridge so much that she did not pay attention to Melody's other command. Stop, pot, stop! They ate and ate until the pot was empty and their stomachs were full. Melody's mother rubbed her stomach happily. Melody then thought, Oh, it's time for me to go and sing a song for the forest fairy. So she left the house and went into the woods again. Here at home, <laughs> her mother was so happy Ta -ta. that they would never have to worry about the food again. She collected all the old pots in which she used to cook <laughs> and threw them away bye bye. to make space See for you the new later. one. Or not. She polished and patted the new pot. All this hard work made her hungry again. Cook, pot, cook, she commanded. And presto, from inside the pot, more delicious <laughs> porridge bubbled up. Not even bothering to get the bowl, she ate directly from the pot. Mmm, delicious! But as quickly as she ate, the pot kept filling up until it was set to bubble up right over the edge. Oh dear, how did Melody make the pot stop? Enough pot, enough! But the pot bubbled on. It's plenty, Pot. It's plenty. The porridge steamed over the edge onto the table. Really, that will do. The porridge pours over the floor. Melody's mother starts to panic. Cease! Uh, finish! No more! She commanded. Soon, she realized that she had made a great mistake and ran away. The porridge poured out from the doors and windows onto the streets, bubbling and forming a great wave and rolled through the village. People gathered up on their rooftops and started to call for help. Melody heard the villagers calling out in distress. She raced down the woods towards the village. She took a wooden plank and a stick and rode towards her house. When she reached just outside her house, she shouted, Stop, pot, stop! And that is just what the pot did. As the bubbling subsided, Melody saw that all the villagers were reaching down and lifting a handful of creamy porridge to their mouth. The whole village enjoyed the porridge. They ate and ate and ate the whole winter long. And no one in the village was hungry ever again. The End Wizard of Oz Many years ago, in a place called Lawrence, there lived a little girl whose name was Dorothy. 
she lived with her Aunt M and Uncle Henry on their farm. She had a dog named Toto. One day, she noticed strange weather. The clouds were dense and thundering loud. Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky, which was even grayer than usual. Dorothy stood in the door with Toto in her arms and looked at the sky too. Aunt Em was washing the dishes when she heard a loud wail of the wind, and she ran towards the door to see if the storm was about to come. Suddenly, Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and ran towards the cyclone, and she too ran behind to catch him. After a while, finally, Toto hid under the hot aired balloon, which halts beyond the farm. There, she met a very interesting person. He was called Professor Marvel, and that big hot aired balloon was owned by him. He greets Dorothy with his magical words. Sim, sim, salabim. If my words are worthy, you are the little girl Dorothy. Dorothy was curious to know how he knew her name. But suddenly, she saw a big twister coming towards them. So she picked Toto and ran towards Cellar as fast as she could. When she got back, it was too late. She ran into the house, but when the twister came, she fell and hit her head. The wind lifted the whole house with Dorothy and Toto inside it, high up in the air. After some time, the house landed down on the ground. Dorothy steps out and finds that she was in a very different place. The place was much more colorful and beautiful than Lawrence. Soon Glinda, the kind witch of the North, appeared and welcomed her. Welcome, Dorothy, to the land of Oz. I am the witch from the North. Oh, my, my, I came here? As I remember, there was a tornado and then, then... And then you came here, my dear Dorothy. That tornado was the portal to enter in the land of Oz. And I am so grateful to you for having killed the wicked witch of the East. You are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I have not killed anything. Your house did anyway. And that is the same thing. See? Glinda pointing out to the corner of the house. There are her two feet still sticking out from under a block of wood. Dorothy could hardly believe and cried out of fright. The sister of the Wicked Witch also saw what all happened, and soon she too reached the site. She was flying above on her broomstick and was very angry with Dorothy for killing her sister. You little rat! How dare you kill my sister? Even you dare to wear my sister's ruby slippers, which belong to me now. I will not spare you. Dorothy had no idea how the ruby slippers came to be on her own feet. But they wouldn't come off, as she tried several times to remove them. And then suddenly, Wicked Witch of West cast a spell on Dorothy. But it overturns on herself and she gets caught on fire. Cursing her, she said, You little rat, soon I will come back and show you my fury. The witch flew away saying this, and now Dorothy had made a sworn enemy. Dorothy got scared and said, Glinda, what do I do now? She will definitely come back for me. <laughs> oh dear. Don't worry. Now, you go back to Lawrence as early as possible. But I don't know how to get back home. You must go to the Emerald City. The Great Wizard of Oz lives there. Ask him to help you. How do I get to the Emerald City? Is it a long way? Will you come with me? You must follow the Yellow Brick Road. It is a long way. And those ruby slippers will protect you. No one will hurt you until you wear those slippers. Soon, Dorothy and Toto found the yellow brick road, and they walked along with it. After walking for several miles, Dorothy sat down to rest. 
There was a big cornfield by the side of the road. In the middle of the field was a scarecrow. It was fixed onto a pole. Dorothy looked at the scarecrow and smiled. We have scarecrows in Lawrence, too. That's right! Dorothy looked at the scarecrow in surprise. But our scarecrows in Lawrence don't talk! I don't talk much. The crows are not scared of me. They have brains, and I don't. Oh dear, perhaps I can help you. She stood up and lifted the scarecrow down from the pole. Oh, that's better. I can move my legs now. What's your name? Where are you going? My name is Dorothy. I'm going to the Emerald City to see the Great Wizard of Oz. I have heard only he can get me back to my home in Lawrence. Hmm, never heard that name before, but then I don't have any brain to remember. Do you think that Oz would give me some brains? Why don't you come with me and ask him? Thank you. Indeed, it is a good idea. So they set off together. A little further, they came upon a man made of tin. Where are you going? We are going to the Emerald City to see the Great Oz, in the hope that he will give us what we want. Oh, I have no heart. Could Oz give me a heart? Why don't you come with us and find out? Thank you. I surely will join you. So they all left, following the yellow brick road. The road was passing through a dense forest. The forest was getting darker and spookier. Ruff, ruff. Looking at the moving bush, Toto started to bark at it. And all of a sudden, a big muscular lion appeared from behind the bush. They all were scared and shivering. But she was surprised to see that the lion burst into tears and was crying loud. Hey! First you came from nowhere and scared us, and now you are crying? What a strange <laughs> lion you are! <laughs> I am a coward, and I'm afraid of everything. When I roar, my heart beats very fast because I have no courage. At least you have a heart. And you have brains, too. Toto and I want to go home to Lawrence. I am going to ask Oz to help us get back there. Do you think that Oz can give me courage? Then I wouldn't be a coward anymore. It seems that the wizard is very powerful. You are welcome to come with us and ask him. They all reached the Emerald City. It was a wonderful place where everything was green. The wizard was known to everyone in the city, but no one had seen him personally. They all reached a castle. The castle dome was similar to the hot air balloon that she saw during the storm. Wondering, when she tried to enter the gates, she was stopped by the royal guards. You are entering the Emerald City Castle. How may I help you? We have come to see the Great Wizard of Oz. We've come such a long way, not to waste his time. Then I will ask permission to the wizard. You should all wait here. Eventually, the wizard agreed to meet them. As soon as they entered in royal court, they saw a hologram image of his face on the throne. It was huge and appeared to be very frightening. Sim Sim Salabim. Hello, Dorothy, a child from Lawrence, which I knew. Tell me, dear, what can I do to please you? I know this voice, but from where? Oh, Wizard of Oz, we humbly ask you for your help. Oh, little Dorothy, I will help you, sure. Grab the Wicked Witch's broomstick, and I won't let you endure. Off they went, a little daunted by their task, towards the witch's castle. The Wicked Witch wanted Dorothy's ruby slippers because she knew they had great power. As soon as they reach the witch's castle, she greets them, saying, Hello again, you little rat. Finally, we meet again to your end. Now, give me those ruby slippers, or I will kill you. <laughs> no one will go anywhere from here, and I am going to kill you all. She had a plan of her own to destroy them, 
one by one. She shoots out the fire at them from her broomstick. Dorothy tries to protect herself from that fire. Her slippers glow, and a gush of water comes out of her hand. The fire fizzles off. The Wicked Witch gets angrier. As she raises her wand to cast a spell upon them, Toto runs and grabs her broomstick for Dorothy. The slippers glow again, and Dorothy shoots fire directly at the witch, burning and melting her in her own castle. Dorothy took the broomstick of the Wicked Witch to the wizard. On seeing that they have completed his task, the wizard reveals his true self to them. He was Professor Marvel. Professor Marvel agreed to take Dorothy back to her home in Lawrence. He issued a diploma to the Scarecrow, a bravery medal to the Lion, and a heart-shaped watch to the Tin Man. They all were happy. Glinda, too, appears in front of them. You have helped everyone in the Land of Oz. So, these ruby slippers belong to you now. You can now take them off any time you want. And if you need me any time in the future, just knock the shoes together three times and I will be there for you. Dorothy said goodbye to her friends. Professor Marvel, Dorothy, and Toto take off in the hot air balloon, waving them from above. Before she knew it, she was in her own bed in Lawrence. Aunt Em and Uncle Henry were trying to wake her up. Dorothy wakes up with the long yawn. She tries to tell them about the amazing adventures she's had, but to them, it was all just her dream. As she pulls her blanket off and notices the sparkling red ruby slippers beside her leg. The End The Happy Prince High above the city, on a tall column, stood the statue of the happy prince. He was gilded from head to toe with thin leaves of fine gold. For eyes, he had two bright sapphires and a large red ruby glowed on his sword hilt. One night, a little swallow flew over the city. She was tired and wished to spend the night between the feet of the happy prince. As she was just about to fall asleep, a large drop of water fell on her. She was curious as there were no clouds in the sky. Then another drop of water fell on her. The swallow decided to look for another place to sleep. Just then, a third drop fell. She looked up and saw that these were the tears from the eyes of the happy prince. The swallow, filled with compassion, asked, Who are you? And why are you crying? I used to be a human and lived in a grand palace. While I was kind, humble of heart, there was no sorrow within my kingdom, and my courtiers called me the Happy Prince. After my death, I had been set up on a high pillar. My heart is made of lead, and yet it always weeps when I see the ugliness and the misery of my city now. You poor thing. So, why are you crying now? Far away in a little cottage, the little boy of a seamstress is sick. He's crying because his mother could not give him anything to eat because she is very poor. And all she has to offer the small lad is water from a nearby river. But the little one's stomach craves food. Then how can you help them from here? Take the ruby from my sword hilt and give it to the poor woman. The little swallow obeyed the prince and then flew to the seamstress's cottage and laid the ruby on her table. She also fluttered over the poor sick boy to give him relief from his fever. As she flew away, the poor mother awoke to find the sparkling ruby resting by her hand. Both of them felt truly happy. When the swallow returned, the prince said, I can see a writer. He is suffering from the cold 
and is apparently very hungry. Still, he is writing the story because he will not get anything if he leaves his book unfinished. Dear Swallow, will you please give him the sapphire gem from one of my eyes? No, my prince, I cannot do that. It is my order, dear Swallow. The Swallow did not want to pluck out the sapphire from his eye, but she obeyed the generous prince reluctantly. So the Swallow, once again, flew into the life of another unfortunate soul, even if it was only for a moment, and laid the sapphire upon the writer's desk. She saw that the writer had fallen unconscious due to the cold and suffering from hunger. So she gathered some wood and lit a fire within the man's fireplace. As she flew away from there, the writer felt the warmth of the blaze and slowly awoke. He saw the sparkling sapphire on his desk and with immense joy and gratitude thanked God for providing it. Upon the return of the tiny swallow, the prince said, I have seen a little match girl whose wares have fallen into the gutter. She is very afraid and quivers with fear, knowing that her father would beat her hard if she returned home empty-handed. You have nothing left on you to give her, sire. Dear swallow, I still have my other eye left. Please give it to that little match girl. Never, my prince. I cannot do that. For then you would be blind. If I took the other sapphire from you... I beg of you, dear Swallow. It is the last time I can help someone. After this quest, I will bother you no more. And you can leave me be and continue on your journey. At his command, the Swallow very unwillingly plucked out the sapphire of the other eye of the happy prince, who now was totally blind. The swallow made her final mission for the self-sacrificing statue, and silently slipped the sapphire into the palm of the young match girl, and returned to the prince, saying, I am not going anywhere, my prince. I will stay here with you till my last breath. From this day forth, I shall be your eyes. Now, the swallow reported daily to the now meager-looking statue of the sufferings of the people. At the command of the happy prince, the swallow took off the golden leaves from the statue and distributed them among the poor people to give them wealth so they could each afford a better life. Now, the statue was dull and gray as there was no gold left on him. Soon winter came, and the frost made the swallow colder and colder, so cold that she was about to die. She flew to the happy prince and kissed him on his forehead. This is the final farewell that I shall bid you, my prince. Oh, you have finally decided to continue your journey, my little friend. I am happy for you. Farewell, my little friend. Farewell. No, Prince. I am journeying to my death. My death is certain, as I decided to stay with you that day. But I have no regrets about it, for I am at peace and content. The swallow fluttered haphazardly downward to die at the feet of the statue that she had come to admire and love. The prince cried for an immeasurable length of time, and the lead heart which beat within his now gray form broke in two. The mayor ordered that the statue should be pulled down because it was neither beautiful nor useful. But the broken heart did not melt in the furnace, so it was thrown away and came to rest on top of a trash heap where the poor swallow lay dead. Upon seeing this, God determined to put his angels that he had created to a test. So he said to them, Bring me the two most precious things upon the earth that I have created. Yes, Lord, 
the heavenly beings came upon the same dust heap where the dead swallow and the happy prince's heart now resided, a lowly trash heap. And the angels picked them up instantly. O oh, Father of the heavenly lights, these are the two most precious things we found upon your earth. God praised the angel's choice in bringing him the lead heart of the happy prince and the deceased swallow. Now the swallow will stay here in my garden, and the prince will also stay here and enjoy the beauties of my heaven. Now, whenever Swallow and the Happy Prince see suffering upon the earth, their teardrops fall from the sky and rain breaks forth from the clouds. The End The Little Tin Soldier Once upon a time, a toy maker fashioned 25 soldiers from a piece of tin. They all carried muskets, they all looked straight ahead, and they all wore splendid uniforms of red and blue. At last, when it came to the last soldiers that were made, there wasn't quite enough tin. The toy maker only had enough to give the soldier one leg. But that soldier didn't mind. He was very proud to be different. He was very proud of his one leg. He stood erect, carrying his musket, looking straight ahead in his bright red and blue uniform. The toy maker placed all 25 soldiers tightly into a box. Then he carefully gift wrapped the box. They were a birthday present for a small boy named Jojo. When the little boy saw the box, he let out an excited yell. Ah, tin soldiers! Thanks, Mommy! Jojo emptied the soldiers out on the floor and selected the last tin soldier for the duty of captain because he was different, and that made him special. Jojo placed him on top of the cupboard beside the toy hippo where the soldiers could see. A brown teddy bear, a slinky dog, an astronaut, a box labeled Jack, a magnificent castle with a swan floating on a lake, and, standing at the castle door, was the most beautiful girl the soldier had ever seen. He fell in love with her because, like him, she only had one leg. I have never seen anyone so beautiful. Lucy? Yeah, she is. She is always on one foot. She is a determined ballerina. Oh, I am sorry. I did not mean to be rude. I didn't realize I was talking out loud. Oh, you are a really good soldier, humble and respectful. I am honored, sir. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Since you're here, you should know. Jack in the box toy is tricky and mean. Thank you for your kind advice, Mr. Hippo. That's all he said to Mr. Hippo. And then he said to himself, I shall make her my wife. But what the soldier didn't realize was that the beautiful lady was a ballerina, and these types of dancers held their other leg high in the air to dance. And that's why he could see only her one leg from his position. Every evening at midnight, when the clock struck twelve, all the toys would come alive and they would play. The little tin soldier was determined that at that time he would visit the castle and ask for the beautiful lady's hand in marriage. But another thing which he was unaware of was that the jack in the box was also desiring the ballerina as a wife for himself. At the stroke of midnight, he began to hop in the direction of the castle. Firstly, he jumped from the cupboard and with many hurdles, he finally climbed the table to reach near the castle. Suddenly, the lid of the jack-in-the-box popped open, and a frightening and hideous face jumped out and stared down at the little tin soldier. <laughs> I'm Jack. She's out of your league, soldier boy. And anyway, you only got one leg. 
There was a moment of silence between them. You live in a box. She lives in a castle. Give up. The little tin soldier looked up at the castle. The beautiful dancer had been watching him. She smiled. He started bouncing towards the castle. Tin soldier! Jack practically spat the words out with a fury in his eyes. Don't wish for something that doesn't belong to you. The tin soldier ignored Jack's ominous voice. Very well. Wait until tomorrow. <laughs> Bad things will happen. An ill wind will carry you away. And with a fiendish laugh, he disappeared back inside his box. I wouldn't take any notice of Jack. The little tin soldier glanced towards the castle and the beautiful lady. He lay down beside the lake, watching the Lucy. Finally, he drifted off to sleep. From there, the soldier could survey the whole room, and the lovely Lucy was smiling at him. So he smiled back. But he can't see Jack's box. Suddenly, a gust of wind caught the curtain. It flipped the little tin soldier backward out of the open window. While he was falling, Jack's words tumbled through his mind. An ill wind will carry you away. And he heard Jack's fiendish laugh in the wind. <laughs> the little tin soldier landed on the pavement. Then, heavy drops of rain started to fall. It wasn't long before water was pouring down the gutter beside him. What bad thing is going to happen to me next? He said to himself. As if in answer, two boys came running down the street. They thought it would be fun to send a little tin soldier out to sea for an exploration. They quickly made a small sailboat out of an old newspaper and placed him inside. They sent a boat sailing down the gutter. The little tin soldier shouldered his musket. He wondered, Will I ever see my beautiful dancer again? Large waves rocked the boat up and down. Suddenly, the boat dipped down and rushed into a drain. The little tin soldier trembled. He held on to his musket tightly. What on earth is happening? I bet Jack is behind this. Inside the drain, it was very dark. In the distance, he saw what looked like the headlights of a car. As the boat floated closer, the soldier realized that the two lamps were in fact eyes. The eyes of a huge, ugly water rat. It was the Border Patrol. He cried, Passport! The tin soldier remained silent. The water rat's hand reached out to make a grab for his passport. But the little tin soldier was too quick. He crashed his boat through the straw barrier and sped away. The rat gave chase. He screamed, Stop him! Stop him! He hasn't paid me his toll! He isn't got a pass! But the roaring water surged on. The little tin soldier could already see daylight ahead. Freedom! Freedom! I might still get home to see her smile once more. As the little boat rushed towards the daylight, the soldier heard a noise. It was a waterfall. The little boat shot out into the air. Way below was a canal. Mm, not again. Although he was frightened, he refused to close his eyes. The boat spun and swirled and crashed onto the surface of the water and finally drowned. The soldier was thrown into the thunderous water and everything went dark. He had been swallowed by a fish. As the soldier lay in the fish tummy for several hours, a flash of lightning struck. Then he heard a voice which he recognized. Oh my goodness, it's the little one-legged soldier! The fish that had swallowed him had been hooked, taken to the market, and sold to Jojo's mother. When she sliced it open, she found the little tin soldier. She carefully dried the soldier and then put him in the castle next to the beautiful dancer and left. The soldier sees her smile and his heart melted. 
he bowed down to ask her for marriage and seize her other leg. He got disappointed because he thought she could never say yes. But suddenly, he heard a soft voice. You are a Captain Tin, right? Yeah, yes, ma'am. I want to say something. Please, go ahead, ma'am. I love you since I saw you on that cupboard. Will you marry me? Little Tin Man was surprised, and he quickly said yes. But then the clock chimed midnight. Jack came out from his box. He was looking furious as rage filled his eyes. He quickly drew a sword from his box and said, I told you not to wish for what doesn't belong to you. Lucy is mine. Prepare to die. Little Tin Soldier rose up and put forward his musket, which had a bayonet. They started fighting in front of the castle, and suddenly, Little Tin Soldier put his bayonet in Jack's box and swing him back towards the burning stove. With a loud scream, Jack fell into the burning stove, and he burnt to his death. Little Tin Soldier and Lucy hugged each other, and they went straight to the palace to live. Then they lived happily ever after. The End The Little Match Girl It was a bitterly cold evening. Flurries of snow filled the sky and covered the darkening village below this New Year's Eve. Oh, my sweet little child, I am so sorry I have to send you out into the frozen darkness to sell these matches this evening. But... As you can see, I cannot walk because I'm sick. Yes, Grandma, I understand. And remember, sweetheart, with the money you make from selling these matches, we can eat tonight. Otherwise, we will be forced to try and sleep with our stomachs empty. Now go, my child. Don't worry, Grandma. I will sell all the matches, and we'll be sure to bring home lots of food as well. Goodbye. In this chilling darkness, there whisked along the cobbled stone streets a poor little girl who was nearly eight years old and an orphan. She had to cap to warm her head, and her clothes were all threadbare and nearly worn through in places. She walked with calloused and wounded bare feet, for she had no shoes. She stood on the corner, clinging hopefully to the matchboxes which she held in her thin, bare hands. People bustled all about her, busy with Christmas shopping, not even giving a glance to the poor little child. Sweetie, do you like what I bought you in that toy store? Oh, yes, Mother. The doll is pretty. Thank you. And the dress is so lovely. The little match girl's eyes filled with tears. But there was no time to cry, for she must sell some matches so she and her grandmother can have dinner that evening. So she bravely wiped the grief from her eyes and said to the woman, Lady... Would you like to buy some matches, please? They're very sturdy and nice. No, I don't need matches. Get away from my daughter. I don't know why they let these kinds of people on streets to mingle among decent people such as ourselves. Look at her dress, Mother. It's so old. I'm sorry, but these are the only clothes I have. It's not my problem. And besides, I don't have money. Even if I did, I wouldn't buy matches. So get away and leave us alone. But they're only one penny each. Don't you understand? I don't want it. Now go away or I will call the police. The little match girl trembles. Snow begins to fall. Once more, 
as she presses on with her quest to try and sell matches to people passing by. Ma'am, please, would you like to buy some matches? They're magical, you know. When you light one, all your wishes will, will come true. That's nonsense. Those are fairy tales. But ma'am, please buy at least one. Its light will give you the most wonderful Christmas. I told you. No, I don't need one. It is true. Each one is different. I don't want matches today. Why don't you go home? It's a cold night. I can't, ma'am. I don't have parents. And my grandma is very sick. I don't have any money left to buy medicine or food for her. I do wish I could help you, my dear. But I do not have enough money to spare. Maybe somebody else will buy some from you. Maybe. Maybe. The little match girl's spirits began to sink as the cold winds became stronger and swirled round about her frail form, seeming to snatch at her with its icy claws. With a final blast of determination, the little match girl continued to offer her wares, but to no avail. Finally, feeling alone and defeated, she slumps down upon the sidewalk, shivering uncontrollably from the cold. My hands and feet feel like blocks of ice. I will light one of my trusty matches just to warm my fingers a little. The poor little match girl's hands were shivering so greatly that she was unable to light a match. After some time and great effort, she lights up one single match. And to her surprise, the matchstick transformed into an iron stove, and the little girl soon began to feel warm. She put her tiny icicle-like fingers closer to the stove. She was very happy, but a few moments later, a snowflake dropped right on her matchstick and snuffed it out. So she stood up and once again tried to sell her matches. Alas, not a single match had been sold thus far. Suddenly, she heard a voice. Hi there, little girl. What do you have there to sell? I sell matches. Would you like to buy one? As soon as she turned towards the voice, she sees an old homeless woman standing in a corner with her skinny dog. They both are shivering with cold. Don't you see that I am as poor as you? Oh, sorry. I have to sell these matches to get some food for my grandma. Poor girl. Well, will you please take care of my dog for me? It will only be here for a little while. I must go and find some food. Perhaps I can bring some food for you, too. Well, at least I can get some food for my grandma. But please come soon, as I have to get her medicine, too. The little match girl agreed to watch after the dog. And the old woman left with a promise to return as quickly as she could. She held the dog's leash as he sat quietly on the corner. In a while, the poor girl started shivering again. She thought for a moment and took out the matchbox and burnt it against the wall. To her surprise, she sees a table full of wonderful things to eat with turkey, lamb, goose, fish, apples, and cakes. Oh, I wish I could eat it all. I feel so peaceful in this place. As soon as she reached for a piece of cake, the flame of the matchstick went out and everything vanished. 
she was very disappointed. She looked up towards the sky and prayed. Oh Lord, please take me out of this sadness. I'm so hungry and miserable. Please help me. Just then, she saw a star falling from the heavens, and she recalled something that her grandma had told her. Grandma says when a star falls, someone dies. My grandma is very sick. Does it mean that I lost my grandma? <gasps> oh, she loved me more than anyone else in the whole world. She took out another matchstick and lit it. She was surprised to see her grandmother standing in front of her. Oh, Grandma, is that you? Yes, child. I am here for you. The little match girl was pleased to see her grandma, but was rather alarmed, for she could see that her grandma was floating in the air. Don't be afraid, my child. I am safe and well now. You don't have to worry about me anymore. The little match girl opens her mouth to tell her grandma how hard she tried to sell the matchsticks. Then the flame of the matchstick went out once again, and her grandma disappeared. This time, the poor child lights all of her matchsticks at once, as she didn't want her grandma to disappear again. And the glow was so bright, it was as sunlight. Her grandma reappears and gazed lovingly at the little match girl, smiling. Grandma, I'm so scared. I don't want to stay here anymore. Please take me with you. Yes, dear. I will take you with me. Give me your hand. Grandmother took the little match girl's hand, then lifted her in her arms. They both started soaring upward to the sky. How are you feeling now, my sweet angel? Oh, Grandma, now I feel wonderful. I don't feel hungry or cold anymore. I feel as light as a feather. Grandma smiled again, and they both flew to heaven. And in that same moment, a little star fell from the sky. The next day, when the sun was rising up again, the little match girl was sitting on the ground with all the burnt matches in her hand, and a contented smile resting on her face. Many people looked on at the little match girl lying lifeless upon the sidewalk. They all grieved for the loss of the bright light that her life was to them. The End The Magical Frog An old woman used to live in a village. She had a very beautiful daughter. Her daughter liked cherries so much that she didn't used to eat anything else. Lunch or dinner, she only wanted to eat cherries. In fact, people also started calling her Cherry now. There was a clever woman living in Cherry's neighborhood. Not just clever, she was an expert in black magic too. And in her garden, there were so many cherry trees with a lot of cherries. Cherry used to sneak in the garden because she could not resist and used to take some cherries. Because of this, the witch was very angry. Cherry was very beautiful, too. Her hair was very long and silky. Her face was as bright as the sun. Her features were so beautiful that the witch could hardly hold her anger. One day, as usual, Cherry was collecting cherries in the garden. The witch saw her and could not hold her anger and cast a magic spell on her, which turned her into an ugly frog. 
poor Cherry. The king of that village had three sons. The king was also very old and weak. The king said to his sons, I will give you all a task, and he who finishes the task shall be the next king. Your first task, I want a velvet cloth that is so soft it will slip right through my ring. And soon, all three of them went out to find such velvet as soon as possible. The elder two brothers brought so many velvets from the market, but the youngest one was walking and thinking how a normal velvet from the market can pass through Dad's ring. He walked very far, looked in so many places, but could not find anything. He was so tired, so he decided to rest on the bank of the river. Suddenly, one frog jumped out of the river and asked him, Tell me what happened. You seem so tense. She had such a sweet voice. Hearing that, the man said, How can you help me? She insisted. At least tell me why you are worried. The prince told her the story, and after listening to that, she jumped back in the river. She came back with a small piece of cloth and said, Take this cloth. This will help you. Something's better than nothing, the prince thought, and left for the palace. As soon as he was getting close to the palace, the cloth was getting heavier. The king was happy that all three of them had come with velvet cloth. He gave them the ring. When the elder sons tried, only a part of velvet could pass through it, and they failed. Then the youngest son gave the cloth. Everyone was surprised to see such clean and beautiful velvet. That velvet could pass through the king's ring very easily. I finished one task! The prince was very relaxed. The king gave them a new task, that he wants a dog as small as he could fit in a walnut shell. Again, all three of them started their hunt. This task was much tougher. Where can you find such a dog? The youngest prince started to walk in the nearest jungle. He walked for so long, and once he was tired, he sat near the same river bank to get some rest. Suddenly, he thought of the frog that had helped him last time. Right then, she jumped out of the river. Oh, my prince, why are you sad again? The prince told her the whole story. Wait, let me try and help you again. And then she jumped in the river again. She came out of the river with a dried fruit in her hand. Take this and break it. Once you reach the palace, you will see the magic. The prince happily left for the palace. The elder brothers found a lot of puppies, but they were of no use. They tried to finish the task. But some of them had big heads, some of them had big feet, and some of them had long tails. Both of them were sad. Now the youngest one broke the dry fruit, and surprise, there was a sweet little puppy sitting inside the shell. The king tried fitting this puppy in a walnut shell, and he could easily fit inside. The prince was very happy. The king was very happy too. Now it was time for the third and final task. Whosoever will marry the most beautiful girl will be the next king. Great! This was an easy task. The elder son went out to search for a beautiful bride. They knew so many beautiful girls, but the youngest prince was sad. Now who will help me? That little frog can't help me. She can't jump in the river and find a beautiful bride. He was lost in his thought, and again... He ended up on the river bank. The frog again greeted him. Now why are you worried? It seems you're crying a lot. Can you please tell me what happened? And then the prince told her everything. The frog said, Don't worry. Head towards the palace. As soon as you are close to the palace, look behind you. But don't laugh, please. The prince was not able to trust the frog this time. He started to head towards the palace. As soon as the palace was close to him, he heard some words from behind. He saw behind him and was totally stunned. 
Six very big rats were pulling a cart made of pumpkin, and one very big frog was riding the cart. Inside, on a beautiful chair, there was his friend from the river. This was a very weird scene, but the prince didn't laugh at all. What kind of cart is this? What's happening here? I don't understand any of this. And after a short while, he saw a totally different cart. It was being pulled by two beautiful black horses. The person riding the cart was dressed like a soldier. Inside was a very beautiful girl sitting. The prince recognized her in the very first sight that she was the frog from the river. All three of them entered the palace. Both of the elder sons had a big fleet of beautiful girls, but as soon as Cherry stepped inside the palace, everyone was mesmerized of her, and she was crowned as the queen of beauty, because she was the most beautiful of all. So, my little friends, since the youngest prince finished all the tasks, he was announced as the next king. The end.